Good morning, Interweb. World is log 31. Today we are getting wet and wild. We are doing precipitation. Long-time viewers of the channel will know that I've not covered precipitation before. So this is going to be completely uncharted territory for me. As such, I'm going to be sticking incredibly closely to World Building Pasta's guide. Links in the show notes. And this is not really going to be much of a tutorial. This is going to be much more of a let's build. Now, before we get into things, I just want to talk real quick about coral. Now, on Earth, coral are really picky about temperatures. And as such, we only really tend to find them, at least the surface coral, within the tropics. Hence this grey zone here. Now, a few people, including Bibiridium, pointed out that on an alien planet, alien coral, or coral equivalents, may function differently. Maybe they're more picky about temperature, maybe they're less picky about temperature, etc. So this zone isn't really a hard rule, but more of a suggested guideline. The closer your coral are to Earth coral, the more this zone becomes relevant. And the opposite holds true. The further away alien coral is from Earth coral, the less relevant this zone becomes. Just want to throw that in there because it's an important distinction to make. All right, and with that, let's start tackling precipitation for the first time. My maiden voyage. Let's go. Now, there's a couple of things we need to do this. One, we need a G-plates file open with the topography, ocean currents, and air circulation patterns of the season we're working in. So we're going to be determining precipitation for Northern Hemisphere summer in this video. And as such, I have all the relevant files booted up here. We're going to need our blender file as usual. Now, also we're going to be distinguishing three levels of precipitation, dry, wet, and very wet. And as such, we'll need to add at least two layers here. I've added a summer wet and a summer very wet. You could add another layer for dry, but really you can just say everything that isn't wet and very wet is dry. I've also added a sketch layer on top here so we can do some rough work. And to make things a little bit easier to see, I've changed the blending modes of each of these layers to soft light. To do that, you just twiddle down the drop down arrow, click on the second input field here and select soft light from the menu. Okay, so with our sketch layer selected and the relevant ocean currents and wind patterns turned on, we're gonna start precipitation by marking in areas where we have warm currents and onshore winds. So for example, here we have a warm current, we have winds blowing onshore. So I'm just going to mark in the ocean here that this is a area that's relevant to us. Oh, and for our purposes here, we're going to count equatorial currents as being warm currents. So we're going to extend, I'm just going to extend all the way down to the ITCZ for now. Not much more to it. Warm currents, onshore, mark. Right, those are our warm current onshore wind coasts identified. Next, we're going to mark each of these coastal regions as receiving a air quotes wet level of precipitation. So we're going to switch over to our wet layer and we're going to do some coloring in. So according to Pastor, there's a couple of things you need to bear in mind. We're going to mark in these coasts as being wet. If there's no obstructions, this wet region would extend about two kilometers downwind from where the rains originated. If they encounter, if these rains encounter a front or to the ITCZ, they're going to be blocked. Also, they'll be blocked if they encounter very sharp relief. Again, according to Pasta, of about a thousand meters or more. But if there's gradual relief, the rains will gradually continue up the slope, up to around 4,000 meters. And this is why we have G-plates open, because we can measure out all those distances. So just to cover it again, in G-plates, hit S on the keyboard. Ensure that you've got the correct radius in kilometers up in the top right here. And then simply click on the globe and click again. You'll get a line, hover over it. And in the top right, it'll tell you the distance in kilometers. So we're going to bounce back and forth between G-plates and Blender every time we need to do a measurement. Follow past his guidelines and color in a bunch of areas. So time-lapse mode engaged. <laughs> 
All right, that took forever, but those are all of the warm current wet zones or coastal wet zones marked in. Two things worth noting here, whenever I encountered a region of relief that was extremely steep, at least a thousand meters as per uh, World Building Pass's guidelines, I put in a rain shadow on the, let me get this right, downwind side of the mountain or the lee side of the mountain. The wind is coming in here, it's all wet along the coast, meets a high mountain and creates a dry ra rain shadow on the other side. Now I have tried long and hard to find some sort of papers that covers the width of the rain shadow, but to no avail. So I really am just eyeballing it here. If anyone has any data on this, please let me know. Okay, point number two. When we think of coastal regions here, we're referring to like deep ocean regions, not necessarily to continental shelf regions like in here. Now, World Building Pasta doesn't talk about this in his blog post, so I'm not sure as to what the correct answer is. But I figure, again, let's turn on the winds. If you got a bunch of wind coming in here, it hits this land, no major blockage. We'd expect this wind to continue along this bay here and pick up more water and hence deposit it on the other side of the bay. That seems logical to me. So what I've been doing, and again, not sure if this is entirely accurate, is, and you may have seen me do this in the time lapse, I've been measuring 2000 kilometers from the initial contact with land in the direction of the wind and seeing how far it'll go. And then I'll add on another nebulous little bit. So maybe like 2300, 2400, etc. If there's kind of like shallow water in between initial land contact and then further land contact, if that makes sense. And you can see the same thing happening up here. So we've got wind coming in here. It meets this bit of land here. It hasn't got massive high mountains in this portion. So I figure again, it'll deposit some moisture, pick up some moisture behind it and deposit that moisture over on the mainland. So again, just to reiterate, I take the initial point of contact, measure out about 2000 meters, see how far it gets me. If that makes landfall, I assume that more precipitation has been picked up along the shallow water. So I just extend it in a little bit more than 2000 meters or kilometers rather, sorry. And I think that's everything. I think that's all that I need to chat about. Uh, again, if you need further information, I would highly, highly encourage you all to go check out World Building Pass's post, links in the description. Next step, the ITCZ. Remember the ITCZ is a low pressure zone, low pressure, wet. And in fact, this would be the wettest region on the planet. So what we're going to do as per World Building Pasta, we're going to mark out a zone of influence around the ITCZ, these blue dots here that extends out about 15 degrees either side of the ITCZ. Dead easy, so let's head into a time lapse. All right, one very rough ITZZ zone of influence. Now what we've got to do is we got to like cut chunks out of it for the subtropical highs. Remember high pressure zones dry. So these are in conflict. So we're just going to erase chunks out of the ITZZ around the highs. In our very large oceans, we're going to expand the ITZZ a little bit on the Western shores. And if applicable, I guess, contract it on the Eastern shores a little bit. So let's go ahead and do that. Now that I think is my final zone of influence. So I'm going to pop over to my summer very wet layer and basically any wet areas within this zone of influence, I'm just going to upgrade them to very wet. I am going to paint them in in a darker shade of blue. Okay, next we are going to add wet areas in this zone anywhere where there's onshore winds, be it a cold current coast or a warm current coast. <laughs> 
Same rules as before. You can go about 2km inland unless you're blocked by a front, a steep mountain range, or I guess the edge of the ITZZ zone of influence. Last thing for the ITZZ is to just add in some extra wet areas around our very wet areas, just to blend them out. No hard rules here at all, just feel. Right, stage two done. Next up, we gotta tackle these fronts. Just like we did with the ITZZ, we're going to mark out a zone of influence around these fronts. Because these are low pressure zones, low pressure, wet. The further apart these high pressure anticyclones are that generate these fronts, the wider the zone of influence will be. And conversely, the closer the high zones are, the tighter the zone of influence will be. Now, Whirbling Pasta doesn't give any figures here because it's quite a nebulous thing, but I took his maps, downloaded them and wrapped them around a sphere just to measure what's going on. Based on that, at the thinnest point, these zones should be about no bigger than about a thousand kilometers. And at the widest point, no bigger than four, although that's a bit liberal, maybe, maybe 3000 kilometers. The zones shouldn't overlap the subtropical highs at all, and they shouldn't poke into the ITCZ zone too much. Again, I would encourage you to read Whirlpooling Pasta's uh, blog on this for more information. Okay, done. Now, in testing, this part was the part that I sucked most at. I found that my natural inclination was to draw these zones a little bit too small, and thus I ended up with like a drier world. So I hope I'm not like overcompensating here by drawing them way too big. We'll see, I can always fix off air. Just like before, we're gonna take any wet areas in these zones and we're gonna upgrade them to very wet. Cool, so next up, we're gonna add new wet areas. Again, just like with ITZZ, inside these zones, anytime we get onshore winds, be they onshore winds on warm current coast or cold current coasts. There's a little knack here. If we pop over to say, yeah, say this zone here, you'll notice that in this strip of land here, there's no coast within this zone. That doesn't matter. The idea is that winds will carry precipitation from the coast into the zone, as long as this zone is no more than about 2000 kilometers away from the coast. So just eyeballing it, we might get some wet areas here, despite it not being coastal. Anyways, time-lapse mode, engaged. All right, and final thing we got to do with these fronts is that the ITCZ, right, is a very stable sort of thing. These mid-lat fronts aren't as stable. So what we're going to do is we're going to imagine what happens if this central pink line were to shift either side of the zone. We're going to figure out like what that does to the wind pattern, whether or not new onshore winds are generated and then put in wet areas in that region. So for example, there's a good one down here. Yeah, this line here, right? Here's the center of the front. This high pressure zone is sending out winds and it's kind of skimming along the front and moving upwards. But if this front were to move over to this edge here, this high pressure zone is then going to throw off a bunch of winds onto this peninsula. And these, these offshore winds are going to be pushed back. So this whole peninsula will gain onshore winds and will add wet regions there. So we're going to do that for each of the fronts. And then that is fronts completely done. I should really stop saying this, but time lapse mode engaged. Okay, sorry to interrupt the time lapse, but this process can get real tricky. And again, I'm not, this isn't really my area of expertise here. So a little bit out of my depth. This middle front, we imagine it on the extreme over here. 2000 kilometers downwind would take us roughly to the end of this section of peninsula. So that would mean that all these onshore winds would extend all the way basically to the edge of the zone of influence which is fine. But we also have a bunch of winds ordinarily coming in from this anticyclone, creating a rain shadow here. So we kind of have something at odds here. 
under some conditions there's a rain shadow created here under other conditions there's a bunch of onshore winds i think what is prudent is to mark in all the wet areas but i'm unsure so if you should let me know what you think folks I think that's done. I really find this step the trickiest to do just because it involves a little bit more visualization than the other steps, but I think, I think it's sorted. Next up, orthographic rains. The basic shtick here is that we are going to identify regions of sharp relief, like say this area here. To put a number on that, you're looking at areas where there's about a thousand meters of elevation change over a very short distance. Again, like the front of this mountain range here. What's going to happen is a bunch of moisture is going to be taken from the sea, carried along by the winds. And when those winds meet this area of sharp relief, they're going to be forced upwards and they're going to dump their moisture. Ergo, on the upwind side of mountains, we're going to get some wet areas. Again, we're going to mark out a zone of influence that's going to be about, say, a couple of hundred kilometers on the upwind side of sharp relief areas. Okay, I think that's them all. Now, a couple of points here. You'll notice we have a big steep section of relief here, but I haven't marked it in. That's because I know it's not gonna be wet there because the winds originating from this high pressure zone never travel across water before meeting this area of relief. Therefore, they're not gonna have notable precipitation to dump. And I think I'm justified in saying that sea ice here kind of counts functionally as land. I can't imagine the winds picking up an awful lot of moisture over sea ice, or at least not an appreciable amount. So I haven't bothered marking this in. Similarly, there's a couple of places where I was really close to the subtropical anticyclones. Like for example, here we have a bunch of onshore winds, sharp relief, but I haven't marked anything in here because we're just very, very, very close to a dry zone. Same shtick with this island here. We have some pretty notable relief, but we're super close to the dry zone. So I've just put an X there to be like, don't mark anything here. And actually having thought about it, I think this zone, I think I'm going to get rid of this zone of influence as well, because whilst we are crossing a little bit of water, it's not a whole lot. And this, this wind here, would have met this area of sharp relief, dumped its moisture, maybe picked up a little bit here, although that's hardly the most expansive bit of ocean, regardless would have dumped it here. And I think by the time it gets around to here, it would have just dumped all its moisture. So I think this zone, in fact, I'm just gonna go ahead and delete it because I think this zone is erroneous. Okay, now hopefully you can begin to see a pattern here. We are going to upgrade any wet areas under the influence of orthographic rains to very wet. Right, and the final thing we're going to do on orthographic rains is add new wet areas in our zones of influence, anywhere where the winds haven't traveled more than about 3000 kilometers from the sea or haven't crossed a major mountain range. And we kind of, we kind of touched on this earlier here. Off camera, I checked this. If we have a look at this wind here from the coast here to this area sharp relief is more than 3000 kilometers. So we were justified in getting rid of this zone of influence. It wouldn't have any effect. And with that, let's get started on new wet areas. Orthographic rains done. Now, one little thing here, like per the rules, this is the kind of formation we'd get. I think it's a little bit odd that we'd have like a wet area, this really thin, dry strip here. So I think I'm just going to deviate from the rules and just fill out all of this with wet. That would make more sense to me. Okay, cool. Done. Next up, we have Lee Cyclogenesis. So if we pop over to this area here, right? Imagine this wind here was fairly moisture laden, right? We'd expect it to blow up to the mountain range, 
the air gets forced up, it would dump its moisture and it would ordinarily dump its moisture on the upwind side of the mountain. So here, leaving the lee side of the mountain, the downwind side of the mountain, bone dry. That's the normal state of affairs. But when winds blow over a fairly sizable mountain range, say 2000 meters plus, they can create a low pressure zone on the lee side of the mountain that basically sucks in a bunch of moisture and creates precipitation. So we are going to go through the globe and look for areas like this. Very high mountain range, say 2000 meters plus, offshore winds and the open ocean within about a couple of hundred kilometers of the mountain range. And just like before, existing wet areas within these zones of influences will get upgraded to very wet, and then we'll add new wet areas again within these zones of influences. And now for the final variable before we do the big reveal, the polar front. So what we got marked in here is a very stable polar front. Winds spiral out from the poles, meeting the mid-latitude winds at roughly the same latitude. Basically this sort of thing here, with the boundary region here being the polar front. Now more often than not, it does not look like this. It in fact looks more like this, with this like wavy, very mobile lobe pattern. Recall the ITCZ was pretty stable. Our mid-latitude fronts were a little bit less stable and the polar front is is less stable again. It's just constantly changing. So to account for this world building, Pasta advocates adding in a zone of influence. Again, links in the description to the methodology that extends down to about 40 degrees latitude in the summer hemisphere and 30 degrees latitude in the winter hemisphere. So let's do that part first. All right, now to model this wavy pattern, we're gonna take chunks out of this zone of influence, which by the way, extends from the pole to this green line we've just drawn. We're gonna take chunks out of the zone of influence broadly following our wind patterns. And hopefully that will lead to a, um, a wavy looking zone of influence. Okay, two zones placed. So because the polar front is like weak and ever-changing. We're not going to add any very wet areas, but we will add wet areas to all coasts within this zone. If the winds are moving onshore, we'll extend the wet areas 2,000 kilometers inland. The winds are moving offshore, we'll extend those wet areas 1,000 kilometers inland. And if the winds are moving parallel to the shore, we'll extend the wet areas 1,500 kilometers inland. Nearly at the home stretch, let's go. All right, so here I'm very undecided as to what to do. We got some offshore winds happening here, so we want to bring the precipitation in about a thousand kilometers. Now, if we define the edge of the land as being the edge of the continental shelf, this is a precipitation pattern we get. If, however, we account for this bay, the precipitation would be dragged way inland into this basin. So I'm just going to be conservative here and leave it the way it is. Maybe someone with expertise could let me know in comments and we can always add in more precipitation because it's the final step um, at a later date. Or, I don't know, like this basin's going to be hella dry. And we did create this bay for the sole purpose of bringing some moisture into here. So maybe even if it's not strictly correct, we should just go with that. No, no, no. I'm just going to, I'm going to go to conservative route. Someone let me know in comments what they think. And yeah, we'll amend from there. Anyways, onwards. Whoops, I forgot to cut out this chap, so I'm gonna have to mend this zone of influence. Be right back. Much better, onwards. Okay, that is us done. Anything that wasn't marked as wet or very wet is just gonna to default to being dry. 
We were working on Northern Hemisphere Summer here. Off camera, I worked on Northern Hemisphere Winter. So let's pop into Illustrator and compare the two seasons. Right, so this is a state of play in Northern Hemisphere Summer. And here we are in Northern Hemisphere Winter. Summer, winter, summer, winter. This world is uh, dry, very dry. Yeah, man, I, I really do think we need to do something with this bay. This is such a massive dry section in kind of like the, the prime latitudes, you know? And it's always dry too. It's just gonna be like a mid-lat desert, which uh, I don't know if I like that. We'll see, we'll see. I'll have a think about it. You let me know what you think, etc. Oh, here's some side-by-side -side comparisons before we go. All very pretty. I hope you enjoyed, folks. Please, please, please go check out World Building Pasta's blog. I'll leave links in the description to the precipitation tutorial. Massive thanks to himself for putting this methodology out there. All right, that's us. Take care and until next time, Edgar Grouse.